Building. All right, now I can get ready to start. Uh, shalom, everyone. Good to see everyone out there. Now I can actually get ready to start. Elders and children from the Assembly of Sound Doctrine and Truth. Uh, like, subscribe, share, as I stated uh, before. Also on YouTube, which is uh, PK Dash Resurrection Christ in the Kingdom. You can see that there as well. You can also go to the YouTube channel, SF Wisdom, to get. A lot of uh, great information about our review, and then you can go to our mentors page. All things from the Word of God. So that's all of the places that you can go to find a deep understanding. Well, for you guys, I definitely would like to know a little bit more about what you are saying. So I'm gonna jump right into it. It's all about. how the kingdom is actually being revealed. <coughs> One sec. All right, that came out of nowhere. All right, so now, let's get ready to get started. We're going to get, get started right now. If you can, uh, please ping people in the room to show some support. I'm going to start whenever I get the red ping, where I can't ping anybody anymore, and then, okay, there we go. All right, so let's get ready to get this all started. Um, I'm going to actually, once we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, right, and all things pertaining to the kingdom of heaven, first of all, we have to look at where this heaven and earth situation or understanding originated from, right? And we know that Moses himself originated this heaven and earth scenario in Genesis. So I'm just going to get it on my screen right here. Uh, I need to go to Action Light Control. 
today, but all right, let's see what that do. All right, there we go. So once you go to Genesis chapter one, flat reading, in the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. And if you leave it right there, Moses is talking about the creation of heaven and earth. And then as, as you go down and you keep reading, uh, you get more and more information about heaven and earth and what everything was and was not. That's usually how people read it. But I'm here to say that the people of the Bible, they did not look at it like that. Here to say that that would be more of an, a, a different understanding that formed later on. Uh, we have Moses, very, very much intelligent, raised in the house of Pharaoh, uh, learned from different uh, principles, learned different principles from all walks of life, very much educated in the Egyptian culture. And if you know anything about Egyptian culture, very, very, very symbolic in nature so what people would do they would look at this uh scenario about the creation of heaven and earth and and they would look at it from the from the mindset that he's talking about the universe but we are gifted and we are blessed enough today to have writings left over by the jews of about what some of these things actually meant. So I'm going to dive into my brother Philo the Alexandrian Jew. Alexandria was in Egypt. Let me say it again. Alexandria was in Egypt. Yes, indeed, the same Egypt that Moses grew up in. So, uh, and then you can go into the New Testament, uh, you find out in the book of Acts, when uh, the ladies, uh, now I can't pull it right now, but I just can paraphrase the story. The ladies came across this man from Alexandria, Egypt. And they said that he was so wise and intellectual when, in knowing all things except pretty much the baptism of Christ. That's what he was lacking in that. Uh, he, had, he, had, uh, he was a virtuous man. Uh, knowledgeable, in fact, he was preaching himself, knowledgeable in all areas except the areas dealing with the baptism of Christ, if I can recall correctly. And that's because he's from Alexandria, Egypt, and the baptism of Christ, it was more centered around uh, Jerusalem. So, and then we know it expanded eventually. But that being said, we have an understanding that in Alexandria, Egypt, these were people, there were people that knew things about scripture, about Torah. They knew these things, and they was considered wise in their knowledge that they had. They just didn't know about the baptism of Christ, which came later on. So, just like Moses was in Egypt, just like this, uh, the guy that they baptized was in, in, in Egypt, just like Philo was in Egypt. And just for my people, Philo, 20 B.C. through like 50 A.D., contemporary to Paul and et cetera. So I'm here to say that maybe this man, this man knew what he was talking about when he was trying to explain what Moses was actually saying. So now uh, let's go into his writing. In order to understand the kingdom of heaven, first we might need to understand heaven and earth that Moses was talking about. So. We're going to go to allegorical interpretation nine. Um, I actually have it on my screen here. And we're going to read sections uh, 21 and 22. Right here. Let's see. Page nine. All right. This is what it says. It says, on which day 
God created the heaven and the earth and every green herb of the field before it appeared upon the earth and the grass of the field before it sprang up. For God did not rain upon the earth and man did not exist to cultivate the earth. This day, Moses had previously called a book, since at least he describes the generation of both heaven and earth in each place. For by his most conspicuous and brilliant word, by one command, God makes both things. So now, this is what Philo's finna go in here, and he's finna to explain what Moses was bringing out. So we know that it says heaven and earth, but now Philo is going to explain what's actually going on. He says, one command, God makes both things. The ideal of mind, M-I-N-D, mind, which speaking symbolically, he calls heaven. And the ideal of sensation, which by a sign, He named earth. So, first thing, when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, right? The rulership, the authority, the imperial rulership that's in heaven, we have to understand that when Moses was speaking on heaven, he was actually using it symbolically to represent the mind. So now, 22 now. All right, 22. It states, and he likens the ideal of mind and the ideal of sensation to two fields. For the mind brings forth fruit, which consists in having intellectual perception. And sensation brings forth other fruit which consists in perceiving by the agency of external senses. And what he says has the following meaning. As there was a previously existing ideal of a particular mind and also of the indivisible mind to serve as an archetype and model for either, and also a pre-existing ideal of particular sensation, being, so to say, a sort of seal which gave impressions of forms. So before particular things perceptible only by the intellect had any existence, there was a pre-existing abstract ideal of what was perceptible only by intellect and by participation in which the other things also had received their names and before particular objects perceptible by the external senses existed, there was also a generic something perceptible by the external senses in accordance with the with a participation in which other things perceptible by the external senses was created. So in other words, instead of all of those words, Philo very intelligent. In other words, he said that he's looking at heaven and earth. Heaven is something invisible that you can't see. Earth is something tangible that you can see. So he said that he's, he's using the ideal of heaven and earth to represent the mind, something that you can't see, that would be heaven, the mind, and earth would be the outward sensations, something that you can see, something that you can come in contact with, in other words. So he was saying that since you can see the earth, he was using earth for the outward sensations, and since you can't see heaven, he was using the mind for the inward ideals. So you got an inward ideals, you got our out sensations, and they're either they work together for the good or they work together for the bad. So that's all that's all he's saying. Heaven invisible, can't see, that's the mind. Earth visible, you can see. That's the uh the things that you come in contact with. Okay, so now if we have that idea that in the beginning we're focusing on the mind and have the mind perceives things, right? How the mind perceives something inwardly and outwardly. So this would be the heaven and earth that Moses is speaking on. 
and I know people might say, ah, no, dude, that sounds, that sounds crazy. But I'm here to say that as we go further on in the scriptures, we're going to see it with 100% accuracy. This is what's going on. Brother Josephus, can you hear me? Am I picking up? Anybody, if I'm picking up, let me know. Hello? Okay, then. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, all right, there we go. All right, so now, let's, let's continue uh, to go on a little more. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, now you good, my brother. Uh, so now I want to go into allegorical interpretation 12. And I'm going to start reading at section or line 31. And watch now. You guys are actually finna see how much intellect is going on what Moses is describing. And we got to understand that Philo was in Egypt. And let's see how close he sounds to Paul. Once again, Philo, Egypt, uh, actually, I believe he lived before Paul, uh, definitely, but because uh, he was created, he was he he started living like 20 BC. But anyway, we got Philo in Egypt. We got Paul, uh, Roman citizen, and etc. Going around uh, the provinces of Rome and etc. But listen to how these guys agree on certain principles. Okay, so this is 31. It says, And God created man, taking a lump of clay from the earth, and breathed into his face the breath of life. And man became a living soul. The races of men are twofold for one is the heavenly man and the other the earthly man now the heavenly man as being born in the image of god has no participation in any corruptible or earth-like essence so now let's show you what Philo just did with this right here, right? So, Philo stated that there's two races of men. One earthly, the other heavenly. The ones, the heavenly man, born in the image of God. The earthly man, corruptible, having the earth-like essence, right? So, Philo, don't forget, Philo, he's breaking down Genesis 1 and 2. So from Philo's understanding of Genesis 1 and 2, the earthly and the heavenly man is introduced. So once we go to, let, let, let's just try to go there real fast now. Uh, let's see here. My computer is lagging just a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's, it's lagging a lot of bit. Hold on. Ah, right, here we go. Once we go to Genesis 2, 7. Let's look at the earthly man. And God formed the man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his face the breath of life and man became a living soul. So according to Philo, that's the earthly man. So let's go to the heavenly man. You go to Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And God said, let us make man according to our image and likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the flying creatures of heaven and over the cattle and all the earth and over all the reptiles that creep on the earth. And God made man according to the image of God. 
he made him, male and females, he made them. And God blessed them, saying, increase and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the seas, and flying creatures of heaven, and all of the cattle, and all of the earth, and all of the reptiles that creep on the earth. So notice, these are two different atoms here. These are two different atoms. One atom created from earth. The other atom made after the image of the heavenly. Two different types of men, right? One atom he formed and placed them into the Garden of Eden. The other Adam, he told he wanted this Adam and the, the female with him to have dominion over all things. Understand, one Adam wasn't said to have dominion. The other Adam was said to have dominion. He didn't tell the earthly Adam to have dominion. He told the heavenly Adam to have dominion. This is very important later when people are understanding how the Bible is working and how inheritance is working and how the sons of God is, is coming in into existence and etc. Understand there's two different types of men. Only one type of men gets the inheritance. And these will be the ones made after the image of God. But he also called, Philo also called the earthly Adam corruptible earth-like essence right so we're just going to piggyback off of some of this ideology so we're going to go to first corinthians and don't forget all of this started with the mind he said the heaven and earth represented the mind and sensations so anything dealing with the heaven and earth is dealing with a type of mind and sensations. So he, we're talking about how mankind operates mentally. One operation mentally is earthly. Another operation mentally is heavenly. And the heavenly operation of the mental is getting the inheritance. The earthly operation of mental has to be converted over into the heavenly to get the inheritance. So now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, and let's see what Paul stated in this matter, right? And I'm actually going to be reading it out of the New King James Version. So let, let me get to the New King James Version real fast. Right there. All right, so we're going to read 1 Corinthians 15. Let's, let's put it up on the screen. I spelled that miserably. Sorry about that, y'all. All right, and I'm going to start at verse 45. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So this will be your actual Genesis 2 and 7, when the last Adam, which was the Lord, blew life into the first Adam, which was the one that was on the ground. But anyway, verse 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So we see two men right here. One of the dust, the other one of the heaven. Verse 48, and was the man of the dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. And as the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So remember, Philo was making this be 
two different types of men, two different types of way of beings, a way of doing things, two different types of mindsets, right? And we we can't forget that Philo stated, let, let, let's, let me read it again. This is what he stated. He says, uh, now the heavenly man as being born in the image of God has no participation in any corruptible or earth-like essence. So, according to Philo, the corruptible or earth-like essence would be the man from the dust. He said the man, the heavenly man, doesn't participate in the corruptible or the earth-like essence, right? So corruptible here represents the earth mind, earth-like mind, not heavenly mind. So once you go back to Paul's uh, next explanation, verse 50, as he continues, listen to what it says. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So now, what would be incorruption according to Philo? That would be the heavenly mind, uh, man, that man that had the heavenly mind. What would be the corruptible? That man that had the earthly mind, the earthly man. So he's saying that the earthly man cannot inherit the heaven the things that the heavenly man inherits right there's no inheritance there's no inheritance for the earthly man that's why in genesis 1 26 the one that was told to have dominion was the heavenly man he never told the one in genesis 2 to have dominion only the one in genesis 1 only the heavenly man made after the image of God had inheritance. So here, this is what's going on in verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. But then, you know, he tells them a mystery. But what I want to go to is 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So think about what that means right now by knowing what we know. If the corruptible is equivalent to the earthly man or the earthly mind, and the incorruptible is equivalent to the heavenly mind, he's stating that the earthly mind has to be converted over to the heavenly mind in order to receive immortality. So now, 54, for when this corruptible has put on incorruption, when you change your mindset from earthly to heavenly, and this mortal earth has put on immortality, heaven, then shall be brought to pass the saying, then, then, that's when then the saying is brought to pass, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is only swallowed up when the earthly man is converted over into the heavenly man. That's when death is swallowed up. That's when death no longer have dominion over a person and reign. And the only way this occurred was through the Messiah Christ who was made after the image of of the father himself he came down and he shared with the earthly mind i mean sorry with the heavenly mind was supposed to be like so now let, let, let's let's continue and then uh i'm, I'm gonna stay uh, a few more then i'll open it up before i move on uh to the next points uh next points y'all y'all know how i do it so uh this will be the uh last point that I want to make I want to make before I move on uh now let's see here let's get back to this screen all right so 
allegorical interpretation, one from Philo. Uh, this is 12, like chapter 12, line 32. This is what he states. I'm going to read line 32, then I'm going to go to 36. It says, and we must consider that the man who was formed of earth means the mind which is to be infused into the body, but which has yet not been so infused. And this mind would be really earthly and corruptible if it were not that God had breathed into it the spirit of genuine life. For then it exists and no longer made into a soul, and its soul is not inactive and incapable of proper formation, but a really intellectual and living one. For man, says Moses, became a living soul. So according to Philo, this man right here actually represents the mind. This is the invisible mind before it was placed into a body. The father is forming this mind, and this mind has this earthly essence to it. It has these, these earthly qualities, only thinking about uh, the, the outward sensations, and the father, which we know was actually was Christ, blew into this mind the breath of life. And then that mind was able to become a living soul. It was able to bring up or, or make that, that soul that it was going to go into alive. And we know what happens next. The mind is infused into that soul. It becomes alive. Then he's able to enter into the Garden of Eden. But let, let's go. So let's, let's remember this, right? Christ, because this is who this actually is. Christ breathed into this mind, and this mind became living. So, uh, let's go to, I'm going to go to 36, and see here. Now, the expression breathe into is equivalent to inspired, or gave life to things inanimate. For let us take care that we are not filled with such abs absurdity as to think that God implores the organs of the mouth or nostrils for the purpose of breathing into anything. For God is not only devoid of peculiar qualities, but he is likely not of the form of man. And the use of these words shows some much, sorry, shows some more secret mystery of nature. 37, for there must be three things. Now listen to what he states now. There must be three things that which breathes, hold on. For there must be three things. One, that which bring, that which breathes in. Two, that which receives what is breathed in. And three, and that which is breathed in. So he said there's three things. That which breathes in, that, that which receives what is breathed in, and that which was actually breathed into it. Now, so let me see. Now, that which breathes in is God, but we know that that was actually uh, Christ the Word. That which receives what is breathed in is the mind, and that which is breathed in is the Spirit, what then is collected from these three things? A union of the three takes place through God extending the power which proceeds from himself through the spirit, which is the middle term as far as the subject. Why does he do this except that we must thus derive a proper notion of him? So now, let's use that and let's go to John. Here. 
Sorry about that, y'all. Let's go to John. Twenty. I'm gonna actually uh, put it out of the KJV. Sorry about that. My computer's running kind of slow today. I don't know what's going on, but we're gonna we're gonna work through it. Uh, we're gonna go to John. Twenty. And we're gonna I'm gonna read twenty one through twenty three. So notice. It's the, the the father breathes in, but here we know it was the word that breathes in. He breathed in the Holy Spirit, and that mind became living. We go to John 20. I want to start at 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So just like the word did to Adam when he breathed in the mind of Adam, giving Adam the spirit, and Adam was able to go up into the Garden of Eden narrative, he does the same thing with the disciples. He breathes on them and tells them to receive the Spirit. So um, we can see right now the, the notion right here is dealing with the mindset. So the heaven, earth, this is all dealing with the human re, uh, human re, uh, a reaction to each other. One inward, the other outwardly. And we see that there's different types of minds one earthly, the other heavenly, and only the heavenly type of being gets the inheritance, not the earthly type. So we got more to uh, uh, unpack. So does anyone want to add anything right now before we continue uh, on? This would be the time to raise your hand or et cetera. And please ping people in the room. Am I still picking up at least? Can y'all still hear me? Huh. Well, I, I sure definitely appreciate it then. Well, let, let's continue then. Uh, once again, if y'all want anything to say, please raise your hand. And uh, we'll, we'll bring you up on stage. We got a uh, very much capable uh moderators on the stage to uh, be able to help you out. All right, so now, as we continue now, let's talk more about this kingdom of heaven. Because when people think about kingdom, right, what usually comes to our mind is a castle. Usually when I talk to people about a kingdom, they, they usually say something crazy like, what's the address? Oh, where's it at? Can I drive up to it? So they're thinking about a physical uh, building. They're thinking about uh, like a castle. But when we think about the word kingdom, we should be thinking about rulership, imperial rulership, right? And uh, if you haven't grew up, because we didn't, you know, we got um, democracy over here, so we really ain't under a, a kingdom like that. We 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 have. Um, the, the ability to quote-unquote vote on things and etc. We got a hierarchy and stuff. But being in the kingdom, we under, you understand that the kingdom rulership is through the people and how the people are set up. So the rulership and how the people interact is really the kingdom, not a physical hub or a physical locale. So, we have to get out of our minds. We got to throw away the notion of a castle. When we're talking about the kingdom of God, we're not talking about a castle of God. We're talking about a imperial rulership of God. 
So now, taking that into notion, let's look at this Garden of Eden. Because the Garden of Eden would actually represent the locale where God or the word dwells. So we can quote unquote make the Garden of Eden the kingdom of heaven because the Garden of Eden is actually located in heaven. That's where the word and the father dwells. That will be their domain. So quote unquote, uh, we can make the Garden of Eden the kingdom of heaven. But let's dive into the aspects of the Garden of Eden. So once we go to the works of Philo, we're going to go to 13. And I'm going to start at 41. This is what he states. For of all things created, hold on, let me make sure I'm here. All right. For of all things created, some are created by God and through him. Some not indeed by God, but yet through him. And the rest have their existence both by him and through him. So this is, to me, this is like the word and the father creating things. But anyway, at all events, Moses, as he proceeds, says that God planted a paradise. And among the best things as made by both, as made both by God and through God, is the mind but the irrational part of the soul was made indeed by god but not through god but through the reasoning power which bears rule and sovereignty in the soul so in other words he's saying all of the wicked stuff god didn't make that hey that's not god's making nobody wicked god was the one who actually created the soul but he didn't put the wickedness of mankind in the soul. They did that themselves. But he still have some, uh, uh, a rulership. He still have a power over them because he, he is their creator. But they're the one who put their own wickedness and evil inside of themselves. That's what it's saying here. So it's made by him and not through him. He didn't do that. So now, but we have here that the God planted a paradise. And this is the best thing that God made in Genesis, dealing with a, a place that man can dwell, uh, the best place that he made for man, a place that man could be at peace, no sorrow, no mourning, no death, no crying, nothing but love, joy, peace, and righteousness. He created this inside of this place called paradise the Garden of Eden, straight for mankind to have and dwell within. But we find out from Philo, from his understanding, that that is actually another aspect of the mind. So now, let's look at this garden. Okay, so if we got the Garden of Eden representing the mind, and I'm going to go to the Book of Jubilees. 8 and 17 if you don't know who the, what book of jubilees is is found at the dead sea scrolls we have a community of jews that was creating literature how they viewed the torah and etc so now this is the book of jubilees chapter 8 verse 17 it says and he knew that the garden of eden is the holy of holies and the dwelling of of the Lord. So now, if you didn't catch it, right? If this wasn't caught, the Garden of Eden, where the Lord dwelt at, where the Word was walking through, is actually the Holy of Holies. But hold on. Philo stated that he believed from his understanding that the Garden of Eden was the mind. So if the Garden of Eden is the mind and it's the Holy of Holies, that means the Father was to dwell in the mind. His house was supposed to be inside of the mind. 
That's where he was supposed to dwell at. So, put that notion, keep that no notion on how this, this, um, this mind situation is working out through mankind and how the father himself is using that same mind situation to abode, make his abode with mankind. But we, we're going to go through it uh, 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 more. So, one, uh, I want to go to the works of Philo. I want to go to 14 now. Let me see here. It's on page 52. I want to go to Fort. Is it 14? No, 45. Sorry, 45. It is chapter 14, line 45. It says, God therefore sows and implants terrestrial virtue in the human race, being an imitation of and representation of the heavenly virtue for pitying our race and seeing that it is exposed to abundant and innumerable evils he firmly planted terrestrial virtue as an assistant against the water off of the diseases of the soul being as I have said before an imitation of the heavenly and archetypal typical or sorry archetypal wisdom which he calls by various names so now he's talking about he said that um the father they realized that mankind because you know they don't have robots down here and we know from genesis what did he say in genesis that he know from youth the thoughts of man it's wicked continuously or something like that. It's a paraphrase. But in other words, he's saying that he knows that mankind is wicked from birth. He's not coming down here creating uh, robots. So since mankind is wicked from birth in our imagination and the way that we interact with each other and etc., the father gave us a, a comfort, a comfort, the comforter. He gave us a type of wisdom that would help us get over the evil in the world. So now it stated, now now uh, Philo states that the name, the wisdom, this wisdom he's talking about, he gave it various names. So he says, now virtue is called a paradise metaphorically. And the appropriate place for the paradise is Eden. And this means luxury. So now, he stated that the Father gave us wisdom to help us get over some of the wicked wiles of the earth. And using that same wisdom... That wisdom allows us to enter into paradise. But the paradise is metaphorical for virtue. Wisdom allows us to have heavenly virtue. And when we have that heavenly virtue, it's like we are standing and walking along the, with the Father. It's like we are walking in the garden of of Eden. We are in that luxury. We are in that place of wisdom. The Father can can be with us and us with him because we are we are there. We are all, all on one accord. We're using the gift that he gave us, which is wisdom, in order to defeat and not worry about the earthly things. It's keeping us in a heavenly mindset. We are in heaven with the Father, even though we are on earth with the people. So now let's keep going. And the mo and listen to how, how Philo explained it. And the most appropriate field for virtue, remember virtue represents uh the, the paradise in Eden. And the most appropriate field for virtue is peace and ease and joy in which real luxury or parrot or sorry eden 
which in which real luxury especially consists of. So now let me read it again. And the most appropriate field for virtue, remember virtue represents the paradise. It represents the garden of Eden. The most appropriate, sorry, it represents uh, the garden. Eden represents luxury. So now, and the most appropriate field for the garden is peace and ease and joy in which real luxury, in which real Eden especially consists. So now, what sounds similar to that? Uh, in the ver in paradise, now let me, I'm gonna say it without adding anything, and we're gonna find out what sounded similar to that that we find in the Bible. It says, now virtue is called a paradise metaphorically. And the appropriate place for the paradise is Eden. And this means luxury. And the most appropriate field for virtue is peace and ease and joy in which luxury especially consists. So when I go to, let me see if I can get here real fast. And sorry, y'all, for the slow, the, the slow movement on my computer today. Oh, my God. I don't know what's going on. All right. So let, let's, let's show you what that sounds similar to. My whole screen just went. Sorry about that, y'all. My whole screen just crashed for no reason. All right. So once we go to Romans 14, remember the kingdom of God is the garden of Eden. So once we go to Romans 14, verse number 17, look at what Paul says. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For the kingdom of God, the rulership of God, is not eating and drinking, but the rulership of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Same thing that Philo put dealing with what is, is uh, I would say, almost similar to what Philo put with his understanding of the kingdom of God, which is the Garden of Eden. He said in, the, in that same understanding, in that same garden, there's peace, ease, and joy. Paul said it's love. Well, he said it was what? Peace joy and righteousness so they're saying the same thing about the garden of eden or the kingdom of heaven or the rulership of the father but philo makes it be plain and simple that this is all happening inside of the mind where the real garden of eden is located you have love joy peace inside of your mind inside of your heart and with that love, joy, and peace, you are in the kingdom of heaven. You are with the Father. It is something going on inwardly. I um let me make this a last point. So once we go to, and we're gonna actually uh, end it with Philo, and we're gonna go straight to uh, scriptures next. I just like having uh, several outside sources also, so you guys can see. The, the what all of the world was like in around the first century so we can see what the disciples and Christ and all of them was dealing with with the understanding around that time period so we don't westernize or, or try to impose our ideology on what they believe so this is uh the uh, allegorical interpretation 30 line 92 let's look what he says it is therefore very natural that is that Adam, that
That is to say, the mind, when he was giving names to and displaying his comprehension of other animals, did not give a name to himself because he was ignorant of himself and of his own nature. A command indeed is given to man, but not to the man created according to the image and ideal of God. For that being is possessed of virtue without any need of exhortation, but by his own uh, instinctive nature. But this other would have would not have wisdom if it had not been taught to him. So first of all, he says that Adam is the is the mind, but this earthly Adam had to be taught wisdom, and he was taught this wisdom through commands, through commandments. This earthly Adam was taught wisdom. So now, think about this dealing with your law of Moses compared to Christ. The heavenly man that was in Genesis 1 he didn't, re in fact, let's go to Genesis 1. Let's look at what was told to the heavenly man in Genesis 1. And we're going to compare it to what was told to uh, this earthly man. We're going to do that. Hold on, y'all. Give me one sec. Let's go. Oh, not right now. All right, so. Let's look at what he what he told him. Uh, we go to uh, Genesis chapter one. Let's look at what was told to this heavenly man. And God said, "Let us make man according to our image and likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over all the creatures and etc." Right. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to verse 28 and 29. It's in 30. And God blessed them, saying, increase and multiply. Now, understand, this is the Adam made from the from the image of God. This is the Adam created from the image of God, the Adam, the male and the female. And God blessed them, saying, increase and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the seas and flying creatures of heaven and all the cattle and all the earth and all the reptiles that creep on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given to you every seed-bearing herb, sowing seed, which is upon all the earth, and every tree which has in itself the fruit of seed that is sown. To you, it shall be for food, and to all the wild beasts of the earth, and to all the flying creatures of heaven, and to every reptile creeping on the earth, which has itself the breath of life, even every green plant for food, and it was so. So you notice how this Adam made from, that was created from the image of heaven, you notice how this Adam was said to partake, he could partake of any seed-bearing herb, any seed-bearing herb. This is what this Adam created uh, from after the image of God. That's what he could partake of. But let's see what he told this Adam that was created from the dust. Let's see what he told him. So we go to Genesis 2, verse number 16. And the Lord gave a charge to Adam, saying, Of every tree which is in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of it ye shall not eat. But in whatsoever day you eat of it, ye shall surely die. So now, look at the, the Adam in Genesis 1. He could partake of any tree. The Adam in Genesis 2, he could not partake of any tree. He was to command it to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, 
also notice, and Philo makes this point too, so I got to make this point. Notice the language on how Genesis 2 was being spoken of. It went from singular to plural. Let me show you. And the Lord God gave a charge to Adam saying, of, of, of every tree in the garden, thou, singular, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of it ye, plural, shall not eat. But in whatsoever day ye, plural, eat of it, ye, plural, shall surely die. So it was a singular man being spoken to, but it was speaking to the, in other words, this is about the corporate body. It's a single Adam being spoken to, but it's being known that any other outside of Adam, any other within and outside of Adam that eats from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, the day that they eat from it, they were going to die. And that tree of knowledge of good and evil ran throughout the Bible. People just don't know how to identify it. But I will identify it uh, to everybody unapologetically. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was the law that Moses brought down. That's why he clearly stated, today I brought you life and death, good and evil. He clearly states that. So the tree of knowledge of good and evil was what Moses brought. But the point is, the Adam in Genesis 1 could partake of any tree. He knew what to do with that tree also. But the Adam of Genesis 2, that earthly Adam, no, 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 sir. You have to be taught wisdom. You have to be taught wisdom through commands. But the commands that you are picking is the same commands that's going to be judged or used to judge you also. So you that want to be taught that wisdom, if you don't put on the heavenly Adam, you're going to be stuck in a state of trying to learn wisdom and being killed in the process. So he had, in other words, the wisdom was supposed to take him into the heavenly state. He never trans, he never was able to transfigure into that heavenly state. So he always stayed in this other state, in which it will be a state of uh, uh, corruptibility, a state of death, and etc. But Philo was making a, a, a clear distinction how the the heavenly Adam did not need commandments. Let me state it again. Philo was stating how the heavenly Adam did not need commandments. Only the earthly Adam needed commandments. Only the earthly mind needs wisdom. And we're going to see later on if the Gospels agree that the heavenly man doesn't need a law. Only the earthly man needs a law. We're going to see if if that agrees with what Philo just presented, all right, uh, I'm ready to uh, open up. And if nobody want to say, don't want to say anything, I'll move on to my next points. Uh, are you talking about um when when uh the fruits of the mind? You got you got to be a little bit more specific. I, I, oh, but that was a, a a long time ago. But uh, but regardless, go go ahead go ahead and say your point because uh I if I if I rehit it, I just hit it again. But go ahead and say your point, my brother. just another another dynamic uh, another part to what you may want to look at in there about how the spiritual mind is and how we uh sustain ourselves and how, how how they look at food in a spiritual sense.
I guess uh, I'm going to continue then. All right, so now, since we have that this is all dealing with this kingdom of heaven and etc., this is all dealing with a, a, the mindset. It's all about the mindset. Let's look at more on what the Bible teaches, right? So this is my favorite uh, 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 segment because uh, this is when people say that uh, I'm kind of sci-fi-ish, right? And, and, and I actually love it. So let me, let's show how much the Bible was dealing with the mind. So we see Philo, he was talking a lot about the mind, right? And we're going to leave Philo alone now. And we're just going to go to the scriptures. Let's see how much the Bible was actually concentrated on the mind so we can see the heavenly goal, which was dealing with the change of the mind. You reach the heavenly state through the mind. So let's go to... Genesis 3. Now, I'm going finna, I'm finna to show, and, and once I get done with uh, numbers, Brother Mike, I want I want you to come in and, and, and explain what you wrote today on Facebook because it go it definitely goes with what, uh, my lesson that I prepared. And, y'all, we didn't even, we didn't discuss this. So this is just how the most high works. So, uh, Genesis 3 and 7, listen to how it is explained. Genesis 3, 7, and 8. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes to look upon and, and beautiful to contemplate. And having taken of its fruit, she ate, and she gave to her husband also with her, and they ate. Now, we remember that he told them as if they eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, they will die. And I know people want this to be physical death, and this is why they don't understand the Garden of Eden. This is why they don't understand what Christ's ministry was about. This is why they don't understand the resurrection, because they get the Garden of Eden wrong. If you get the Garden of Eden wrong, the rest of your theology in the Bible is wrong. 100%. 100%. So, the, the death, this is going to be the death that Adam and Eve died. This is the death they went through. This is the process of the death they went through when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He told them, as soon as you eat from it, ye will die. So this is what happened. And the eyes of both were open, and they perceived that they were naked, and they sold fig leaves together and made themselves aprons to go around them. So the first thing it says was when they ate, their eyes were open. So now the question would be, is Moses saying that before they ate from it, they was walking around with their eyes closed? Was they blindfolded? Was they walking around bumping into stuff because they had their eyes shut? Of course not. So we clearly see that Moses is bringing into the understanding, and this is very Egyptian in nature, Anybody that know about that third eye and all that stuff, Moses being from Egypt, it makes perfect sense anyway. But anyway, this is when Moses stated that their eyes, this would be something inwardly. This would be something dealing with the mind. It said that their eyes were open, and guess what their eyes were open to? Shame. Their eyes were open, and then they had to sow fig leaves around themselves because they were shamed. That thing comes up a lot in the Bible. Then your eyes are going to be open. Some is going to arise uh, to everlasting. Uh, sorry, some. In fact, let me just get there so I don't butcher it. Y'all remember what, when Daniel stated it? Let me show you what Daniel stated. This is, like I tell you, if you get Genesis wrong, you're going to get all of it wrong. Because this is what people try to use for a physical resurrection of bodies coming out of the ground. Listen to Daniel using the same edemic uh, 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 understanding. Verse two, 12 and 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now where was Adam at? The dust of the earth. What do Adam represent? The mind. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is something dealing with 
mentally, some to everlasting life. Is that not what Adam awoke to when he received the Holy Spirit? When the mind received the Spirit, it was given everlasting life. It awoke to everlasting life because it was able to go inside of the garden. Now, I'd look at immortality, everlasting life differently. But anyway, and some to reproach an everlasting shame. What happened when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Their eyes were open. They woke to everlasting shame. Their eyes were open, and they were ashamed of their nakedness, so they had to cover themselves. And Daniel 12, 3 actually tells you, and the wise shall shine as brightness. So the wise wisdom, this is stuff dealing with the with your understanding, your brain, how your brain works. So this is more things dealing with the mind that people want it to be physical. And that's why, like I said, you get your Genesis narrative off. Everything else is off. Now you got uh, zombies coming out of the grave talking about you're gonna get a zombie body or you're gonna get a Superman body. It just it don't it don't go it don't go. That's not what the ancient Israelites believed. But now, uh, let's let's continue, right? So we have here in Genesis three, seven, eight, that their eyes were open. This is their inward eyes, and they was able to understand things more on a spiritual level. They was under. They was able to understand. They was, they was uh, on their earthly level. Then they got introduced to a heavenly mindset then they violated the covenant or the contract or the commands while in that heavenly mindset which which let them know that they was in transgression they was naked and then when they was naked they died spiritually the whole thing was a spiritual death but anyway Daniel 12 was about a spiritual death and spiritual awakening but we're going to actually look at 2 Kings. Let's go to 2 Kings 6. I'm going to read 16 through 17. It states, And Elias said, Fear not, for they who are with us are more than they that are with them. And Elias prayed and said, Lord, open, I pray thee, the eyes of the servant, and let him see. And the Lord opened his eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses, and there were chariots of fire round about Elias. So now, is it saying that the servant of Elias was walking around blindfolded, and he could not see? No, but he could not understand the spiritual elements around him and what was going on until his inward eyes, dealing with his mind, his inward eyes were open. And that inward his his inward eyes being open, then he could actually see what was happening on the spiritual realm, how the Lord was looking out for them on the spiritual realm. But let's 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 go to another one. Let's go to Numbers. Let's go to Numbers 22, 30 through 31. And the ass says to Balaam, Am I not thine ass on which thou hast written since thy youth till this day? Did I ever do thus to thee, utterly disregarding thee? And he said, No. And God opened the eyes of Balaam, and he sees the angel of the Lord withstanding him in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he stooped down and worshipped on his face. So now we see Balaam. He had his eyes open. Is it saying that Balaam was walking around with his eyes closed right on his ass and bumping into stuff, and he can't see his ass? Of course not. Balaam eyes, his inward eyes, the eyes dealing with the mind, his spiritual eyes was closed. And when the father opened up his spiritual eyes dealing with his mind, he was able to perceive what was going on around him. 
he was able to perceive the angel of the Lord was actually there in front of him, and that's why the ass did not want to go. So he was able to have that perception when his eyes, his mind was open. So now we can clearly see the mind plays a major factor right now in the Old Testament. And we're going to see later on if the mind plays a factor in the New Testament. But Brother Mike, can you bring out what you brought out uh, on Facebook today? Or if it was yesterday?
the time. And Brother Mike, did you uh, get on the staff of, of that website that you're reading? Did you get on the staff so you could uh, create that definition? Okay, I was just making sure. Okay, I was just making sure that you didn't that you didn't get hired on the staff so you can get on that website to create your own definition. All right, y'all. So what he's saying, these are scholars, right? These are scholars. These are found on your Bible, your Bible hub, and all of these stuff. These are scholars saying that these, this is the definition of these words C. But what people didn't do, they didn't teach us that there's two different eyes in the Bible. They didn't teach us that the Bible was about getting the mindset correct. They didn't teach us this. Uh, they opened up and they used a whole lot of stories and a whole lot of things that was written down, and they used it wrong. They used it incorrectly, and this is why our understanding and doctrine is off in the 21st century in the Western world. So now we can clearly see that the scholars are saying the seeing of Christ was something dealing with the mind. And that makes perfect sense because all of the things that I have been reading so far is the Jews continually telling us over and over and over again, these things are dealing with the mind and the per perception of the mind. So now, uh, my brother, he was able to bring that out. I was able to bring it out. So now, let's look at what Moses went through. Y'all remember when Moses went up? Uh, uh, go ahead. Somebody say something. Okay, my bad. All right, so let's see. Uh, did somebody want to add something? Okay, then. All right, so let's see what, let's see what Moses went through, right? So we're going to go to Exodus 34. Because remember, Moses, he, he wrote, uh, uh, quote, unquote, he wrote Torah, right? So let's see what Mo let's see how Moses explained his what he went through, and then we're gonna use Solomon. You know, supposed to be the wisest man of Israel before Christ came. We're gonna see what Solomon how Solomon explained what Moses went through. Let's once again we're gonna see what as Solomon explains what Moses went through. So this is Exodus thirty four, twenty nine. It says, and when Moses went down from the mountain, so for anybody that don't know, I just did a, 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 a lesson last week showing how when Moses was writing about Adam, because Adam deals with the mind, he's actually writing about his own experience when he went into the heavenly Jerusalem and he brought back the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He's actually talking about his own experience. But anyway, verse uh, Exodus 24, 34, 29. And when Moses went down from the mountain, there were the two tables in the hands of Moses. And then he went down from the mountain. Moses knew not that the appearance of the skin of his face was glorified when God spoke to him. Now notice everybody, Moses' whole body wasn't shining like a light bulb. Only his face was shining. So anybody who don't understand, your brain is in your head. Your mind is in your head. Moses, only Moses' head, his face was shining. Only his head, his face. All right, so let's, let's keep going. And, and Aaron and all the elders of Israel saw Moses, and the appearance of the skin of his face was made glorious, and they feared to approach him. And Moses called them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the synagogue turned towards him, and Moses spoke to them. Uh, I guess I, I don't have to go, I'm, I'm just going to go down to verse 35. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that it was glorified, and Moses put a veil over his face till he went in to speak with him. So you notice how they kept they kept making it be known. It's only the face, only the face, only the face. Not his. It wasn't his abdomen. It wasn't his shoulder blades. 
It wasn't his tibula, fibula. It wasn't his phalanges. It wasn't none of that. Only his face was shining. So we're going to let our wise brother Solomon explain what that means. So you go to Ecclesiastes 8 and 1 and listen to how he explains. Who knows the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a saying? A man's wisdom will lighten his countenance. But a man of shameless countenance will be hated. So now, if, if, if the Brenton Septuagint didn't do it for you, let's see if the KJV can, can make it a little bit more clear. Ecclesiastes 8 and 1 from the KJV. Who is as the, the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine. And the boldness of his face shall be changed. So we clearly see we got Solomon, you know, very intelligent, wise person at the time. He's stating that it is a man's wisdom. Where's wisdom at? Is wisdom in your hand? No. Is it in your stomach? No. Is it in your kneecap? No, it's not in your feet. Wisdom starts in your mind. Wisdom starts in your mind. And when your mind receives wisdom, it makes a person face to shine. The wisdom that's inside of the mind makes a person's face to shine. So, let, let's give you an, another example real fast in the Old Testament. And then we're going to go into the New Testament. So, once we go to back to Daniel, oh yeah, I'm going to beat this resurrection of, of physical bodies. I'm going to beat it out of you today. Uh, we, we're going to stop it. we got to stop the foolishness. So, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 12 and listen to what Daniel 12 says. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some, I'm out, no, no, let's go to the Brenton, I'm sorry. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to reproach and everlasting shame. And the wise, that's wisdom, and the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and some of the many righteous as the stars forever and ever. So we see these wise people, they're shining. Just like when Moses got heavenly knowledge, his face was shining. But we find out that from Solomon, this shining is rep it represents the wisdom of a person. Moses got heavenly wisdom. He came down, his face was shining. In Daniel 12, the people that's resurrecting in their mind, that, that resurrection is allowing them to shine. It, they're shining because of the wisdom. We got to quit with the sci-fi. We got to quit with the superstition. We got to understand exactly what the Bible is teaching. We can't get lost up in the language. We can't get lost in the poetic language no more. In order to effectively understand and teach it, we got to understand what the Bible is stating. So now, let's go to another one. Let's, let's go to another one. Let's go to Matthew. Let's look up old Matthew right here. I'm just going to keep it in the KJV. Because going back and forth is making my screen mess up. Mess up. Matthew 17. And let's see about our king. 17 and 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up unto an high mountain. We got to understand that a lot of these things are happening 
on high mountains also. Moses went up into a high mountain. Now Christ is going up into a high mountain. Mountain is like temple language also, just for the people to know. But anyway, verse 2. And he was transfigured before them. So how did the transfiguration look? And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, or Elijah, talking with him. So Christ was fit to receive some heavenly knowledge. And in vision form, because this was a vision, in vision form, it looked like his face was shining. It represents wisdom. Okay, this is this is all wisdom. This is all dealing with the mind. So now let, let me show you something else that's dealing with the mind. A am I still picking up? Okay, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, what we're doing right now, uh, do you want to reset the room before I continue? All right, yes, sir. So now let's continue. Okay, so now we we and we're showing like the kingdom of heaven and all that stuff is actually dealing with the mindset. It's definitely dealing with the mindset, and you got to actually have a heavenly mind to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I know people want it to be a physical low cab that you can actually walk up to and with an address and a castle, but that's not what the kingdom of heaven was. So now, uh. Now, let's show you more about getting the mind correct. And let's show you more about the importance of the mind in order to understand the kingdom of heaven and how the Father really, truly wanted the mind to be for him and his people, uh, uh, the heavenly mind. So now, when you go to Acts 2, right, we're, we're going to talk about the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at what some of the things that were stated in Acts 2. Acts 2, 17. And it should come to pass in the last days. So, of course, the Holy Spirit came in the last days, uh, which was first century. But that's another story for another day. And it should come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So, now, we know that that spirit that was given to Adam, right? That spirit was given to Adam. Uh, that that had, that that earthly mind it went into the paradise to the heavenly mind it was able to experience love joy peace uh, righteousness and etc no p more pain no tears no crying none of that stuff right so he was able to ascend ascend into this heavenly atmosphere and to be at one with the Father right all of that happened because he received the Holy Spirit so let's see what the Holy Spirit was supposed to do. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So we got the, the Holy Spirit allowing prophecy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. 
So now, notice it stated that they were going to see visions and dream dreams. Now, we should all know that visions happen in your head. Visions happen in your mind. Dreams happen in your mind. The Holy Spirit was going to, uh, well, let me, let me show you from the Old Testament why it was important to get the Holy Spirit right here, right? Because this, this was an important uh, notice right here. Hold on, give me one second. All right, so we're going to say Numbers 12, 6, right? We're going to go to Numbers 12, 6. And then we're going to go back to Acts. Let me show you why this is this was important for them to receive the Holy Spirit and et cetera. So Numbers 12, verse number 6. Because remember, he said that he's going to make the sons and daughters become prophets. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. He's going to make them become prophets. Numbers 12 and 6. And he said to them, hear my words. If there should be of you a prophet to the Lord, I will be made known to him in a vision. And in sleep will I speak to him. Not to Moses. I speak to Moses mouth to mouth and not in dark speeches. But to all the other prophets, I'm going to speak to them in a vision while they are sorry, in a vision and in sleep. Where does the vision happen at? In your mind. Where does sleep happen at? In your mind. So the father needed to, he needed the mind correct in order for him to use the mind effectively for his communication, for his purpose. So he stated that I'm going to use your mind where I'm supposed to dwell at as a vehicle to talk to you. So now he said, if there be a prophet, I'm going to make myself known to him. Remember, you remember, and we'll, uh, see, all of this go together, right? He says, if there be a prophet, I will make myself known to him in a vision, and in sleep will I speak to him. Jeremiah 31, it might be 36 in, in the Septuagint. Hold on, 36, might be 38. Might be 38. Hold on, y'all. Give me one second. All right, so Jeremiah 38, verse number 33 and 34. For this is my covenant with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will surely put my laws into their mind. There's more mind stuff. And write it on their hearts, which is mine. And I will be a God to them. And they should teach, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach at all, and they shall not at all teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. Pause right there. They're not going to be saying, Know the Lord, for they all will know me. Go back to Numbers, Numbers 12. If there be a prophet among you, I will be known to them in a vision. And in sleep, I will speak to him. Jeremiah says, I'm not, they're, they're always going to know the Lord. Numbers say, the prophets that know the Lord, he's going to be known to them in a vision or in sleep. So once you go to Acts, we see the fulfillment of why the Spirit came. Acts 2, these are the prophets introduced again. Acts 2, verse number 17. 
And it shall come to pass in the last days, said the Lord, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So that's the sons and the daughters. Now, these are the prophets. Now, how did he say he was going to speak to the prophets in numbers? In a vision and in sleep. What did he say about the new covenant? All will know me. So now, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So it's common sense that the Holy Spirit allowing them to see visions and dreams was because the Lord said, if there are going to be prophets among you, I'm going to talk to them in visions and dreams. So how can he talk to the prophets if they don't have visions and dreams? That's what the Holy Spirit came to do. Make sure they was able to receive the message from the Lord because they would be considered the prophets. And it says, and on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirits, and they shall prophesy. And guess what else they're going to do? I will show wonders in heavens and signs on the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. What did he say he was going to do? I'm going to uh, give them visions and dreams. So guess what? He's showing them wonders in heavens through the visions and dreams. This is why when you go into the book of Revelation, you clearly see the wonders in heaven. You clearly see the blood. You clearly see the fire. You clearly see the vapor of smoke. You clearly see the sun uh, being dark. You see the moon turning into blood. You see all of this while John is having a vision. You this is how it works. This is why the Lord is using the mind in order to get his understanding across. And then people are writing down what they saw. The point is, the mind has to, well, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, let's, let, let me show you another way that the mind was used, right? You go to Acts chapter 10. Verse 9, on the morrow, as they went up on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon a housetop. You see how a lot of stuff, people are always going up to something high, right? They was going up the top of the mountains. Now Peter is walking up to the top of a house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open. So you mean to tell me Peter is seeing something through his mind? Peter is seeing a vision. This was the outcome of receiving the Holy Spirit. It allowed them to see visions to get messages from the Lord. Now Cornelius he was an exception, of course, because it had to happen uh, that way. But here we clearly see that Peter, through vision, was used to receive a message from the Lord that stated, you're going to have to do more work for me. Now, I need you to change your mind. Let me, let me, let me show you how he told Peter to change his mind. Uh, after Peter uh, told the Lord no three times, which is totally ridiculous but because he was so stuck upon the law of Moses totally ridiculous but listen to listen to how the lord changed was trying to change peter's mouth verse 15 and the voice spoke unto him again the second time what god has cleansed thou call that call not thou coming this was done thrice and the vessel was received up again into heaven so it was told to Peter. You see how the Lord used the vision to try to change Peter's mind so Peter can further the work the Lord needed him to do. He said, Peter, what you are calling uh, uh, unclean, don't call it unclean. Rethink the way you are thinking. Change your mind, your mindset. Because we got heavenly work to do. I need you to change your mindset, Peter. All right, so now, let me, let me try to uh, finish this thing out. Let me, let's, let's try to continue, right? 
So let's show you more about, about the mind, right? So once you go to Deuteronomy 30 and 6, listen to what Moses said. And the Lord shall purge thy heart, which is your mind, and the heart or the mind of your seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy mind and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So we see one of the states that the Lord needed the people in was to have a different mind so they could actually love him and live. So their ability to live, their ability to have life was dealing with the perception that they had. It dealt with the mind state that they was in. The mind state that they was in was causing them not to have life. So the father is saying he's going to come to, uh, sorry, the word is going to come through, purge your mind and the minds of your seed so you can change the way you think so you can receive life. See how the kingdom of heaven, we haven't left the mind yet. The mindset, that's what gets you the kingdom of heaven. Not you going to a castle, not an invisible castle, coming visible, and you're, and you're walking up into a castle, not a castle that has a literal 12 gates that never close. You see how all of these things were symbolic for the mind step, the mind uh, a set you needed to be in in order to receive. But let, let's keep going on. Let's go to Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel now. Let's look at one of uh, what, what, what Ezekiel was told. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 28. It says, and I, well, the scripture says, and I will give you a new heart, which is a new mind, and I will give you a new mind. It will put a new spirit in you. Is that not what happened to Adam? Ain't that not what is that not what happened to Adam? Did the earthly Adam, did the earthly mind get a new type of mind when the spirit was put in him, allowing him to ascend up into a heavenly state? So I will give you a new mind and will put a new spirit in you. And I will take away the mind or the heart of stone out of your flesh, which is what the Ten Commandments represented. The Ten Commandments represented the law written on their stony hearts. So I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and will give you a mind of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you and calls you to walk in my ordinances and to keep my judgments and do them. You remember we read earlier that, that Philo was stating that the heavenly man don't need no commandments. He don't need to be taught no commandments because he does everything that he was supposed to do. And clearly here we see when the new mind was going to come, that spirit that, that caused this new mind was going to cause the people to walk in the ordinances. They wasn't going to have to be given commandments to do it because they was walking in the ordinances automatically. They was keeping the judgments automatically. They didn't need commands to do them. They always did the thing pleasing to the, to the sight of the Most High. Verse 28, and ye should dwell upon the land which I gave to your fathers. And I know people want that to be uh, the land of Canaan, but he's going back further than that. He's talking more about the Garden of Eden. And ye shall be to me a people, and I will be to you a God. That's a new covenant promise, right? That's the new covenant promise. And once you go to Jeremiah, one second. Once you go to Jeremiah 39, I'm going to read 37 through 39. 
Behold, I will gather them out of every land where I have scattered them in my anger and in my wrath in great fury. And I will bring them back into this place and will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be to me a people and I will be to them a God. And I will give them another way and another heart. See, I'm going to give them another mind to fear me continually. And that for and that for good to them and their children after them. So you see, once again, he's trying to give them a new type of mind. So now, uh, let's see if I can run through these quickly. I still got a, l a little more, but I'm going to see if I can run through uh, the rest of these quickly. Does anybody want to say, does anybody want to say anything before I try to finish this up? Does anyone want to add anything? If you can, you can raise your hand. Uh, we'll bring you up on stage. If not, uh, I'm going to continue on. All righty, let's try to get ready to, uh, to finish this thing. All right, so now, you got. let's go to Matthew 3. We're going to look at John the Baptist's message. And saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Once again, once you see the word kingdom, quit thinking about a castle. Start thinking about uh, the heavily imperial rulership. Start thinking about the rulership from the Father, the rulership from Christ, and saying, repent. Change the way that you think for Christ's rulership is at hand. Saying, change the way you think for the Father's rulership is near so the first thing was they had to change their mindset changing the mindset allowed them to understand all about the father's rulership all about Christ's rulership but first they had to change their mindset he wasn't telling them to stay in the same mindset. He was literally telling them to change the way that you think. Well, that's John the Baptist's message. Once you go to the Messiah, Messiah uh, 4, uh, Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, change your mindset, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying change the way that you think and do things for <clears throat> the rulership of the Almighty is near. That's the message that he's telling them. That was the message always. The kingdom always dealt with the mindset. If you do, did not have the correct mindset, you would never understand the kingdom. And this is why when you talk to people about the kingdom of heaven, they always go to the book of Revelation and confuse themselves. They go to the book of Revelation, pull out all of Revelation chapter 20, talking about these uh, 12 gates, and, and they, they skip the foundation that was built off the apostles. They skip all of that, but anyway, and, and they skip that the gates don't never close, and they skip that there's no sun or moon inside of this city. They skip all of the things that can that's clearly telling you this stuff can't be literal. They skip all of that and say, this is a literal kingdom coming down, what Christ and the Father is going to be in, and it's not going to have no heaven, I mean, sorry, it's not going to have no moon, no moon or sun inside the kingdom, but when you walk outside the kingdom, that's when you're going to see the moon and the sun because that's the only way that you can keep the, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is going to be reestablished inside of a kingdom that don't even have a moon or a sun. So who knows how, who knows when the day is going to be over because there's no time period to look at and say, I've been in here one day. It, it's all of it's ridiculous, but anyway, we got to start looking at the the, the mental, the mental uh, 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 clarity that the Bible is trying to teach us, right? So now let's look at how Christ. Uh, hello, what's going on? Okay, all right, there we go. 
All right, so let's look at uh, the clarity that, that Christ was trying to explain his kingdom, right? And uh, I, I get ready. I'm going to get ready to uh, cut it off soon. There's so much more I wanted to go in with the Hebrews showing that it was about uh, clearing the mindset. And, well, I'm, I'm just going to skip around uh, and then I'll be done. I just try to get a, just a few more scriptures in. Uh, but th th these about the kingdom, I'm definitely going to go through. Uh, this is Matthew 6. Listen to what Christ stated about the kingdom. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust. In fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, I'm going to have to read it. I'm going to read it out of the New King James Version. Uh, I'm going to have to read this one out of the New King James Version. Sorry about that. Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So he said, don't try to put your treasures on earth where things can be destroyed and where things can be stolen. Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Can't nobody, the, the earthly mind can't tell you how to do that. They, 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 when, when Christ told that guy, hey, sell all the stuff that you got. Come with me. You'll have treasures in heaven. That guy was like, yeah, right. He was like, yeah, right. No, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm good. You, you straight. I, I like my treasures on earth. So now, he says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now listen to what he says. He already told you to put your treasure in heaven. So now he says, for where your treasure is, there is your heart or your mind. There, there your mind will be also. So he's telling you to put your treasures in heaven. And if you put your treasures in heaven, your mind will be in heaven also. If you put your treasures in heaven, your mind will will be in heaven also. This is kingdom principles. Let's go to uh, verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his statue? 31. Therefore, do not, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So he said, don't worry about the things of the world. All of that stress, don't worry about it. That's what the Gentiles, that's what people outside of Christ, outside of the heavenly mindset do. Look, but this is the most uh, powerful one. 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Now, how many people are seeking the heavenly mindset first? How many people are seeking the knowledge of the Garden of Eden first? How many people are seeking what Adam did wrong and what we need to do opposite? How many people are seeking what's in store from, uh, for us from the Father? Who's seeking that first? Who's trying to get that type of mindset going on? Who's trying to experience that so they can understand with the no tears, the no dying, uh, the no sorrow, what all of that stuff mean? Who's seeking for that? Or are we trying to teach cornality? Are we trying to teach law of Moses? Are we, are we trying to tell people you need the law or you're not doing the law, but when the kingdom comes, you're going to be doing the law? He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Who's doing that? Who's teaching that? Because that's what we're supposed to seek first. That's what we need to be talking about first. That's what we need to be teaching 
first the kingdom of God, and then all things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will, will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So we should be seeking the kingdom of God first. And we find out that the kingdom of God is the heavenly mindset. So uh, let, let's, uh, do I need to keep going through? Yeah, yeah, let me read uh, uh, a couple more from Matthew, and then we finna wrap this thing up. Because I know y'all, thank y'all for listening in so long. I definitely appreciate it. I think this was a good message that needed to get out. And thank everyone for uh, leaving, coming back, uh, leaving, sharing, and etc. cetera. Uh, and I promise y'all I'm going to try to uh, speed this up. So uh, Matthew 11, sorry, Matthew 13, 11 through 16. Let's see here. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has... To him, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing, they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. We can clearly see that today. You speak something about Christ and something spiritual, they call it mystic crap. That's, the, that's that mystic crap right there. That's that, that's that mystical crap. That, that's, that, that's that mysticism. And then uh, you, you tell them that they need to be concentrating and meditating on, on Christ. Uh, oh, Christ. Christ taught the law. Christ, Christ taught Moses. Christ is about Moses. If you love the Father, you have to keep the commandments. You got to do this. You got to do that. Bro, are, are you seeking the kingdom? What, what are we doing here? So they do not hear, neither do they see. It, uh, and then he says, Isaiah says that the people, their eyes are closed. And we find out, I mean, we said earlier that their closed eyes, it represented something spiritual. They don't understand with their minds. But but let's, let's, let's continue. Uh, verse 18, therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what is sown in his mind. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So Christ clearly stated that if, a, if you tell a person about the kingdom of heaven, if you talk to him about how all of this heavenly mindset and how you're supposed to be in a heavenly state, and if you get your mindset together, you will actually be in heaven. With the Father, the Father being you, you tell a person about that and they don't understand, immediately they give you all kind of trouble. Immediately the wicked one comes and snatches away everything you have told them and and and, and their mind goes goes right back shut. So Let's get ready to uh, let's get ready to end this. I'm, I'm gonna see the the, the the ones that I really want to uh, hit. Okay, proving that the kingdom of heaven is the mind and etc. So I guess I'm gonna uh, shoot these last ones out and we'll be done. So now let's prove that the kingdom of heaven is the mind. And that's where the Father is going to be at, right? Let's try John 14. Let's see if, if we can see what I'm saying is, is, is correct. John 14, 20 through 23. And, and at that day, you would know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keep them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. 
Y'all know that uh, everybody want to see Christ coming back on the clouds. Uh, you remember that Mike already sto- told us that uh, this this uh, manifestation, this everyone seeing Christ, is with the mind, with the mind's eye. So now he said, "I'm going to manifest myself to the person who loves me." Now listen to what Judas said. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, uh, "Iscariot, whatever you call it, Lord, how is it that you?" will manifest yourself to us and not to the world. So they understood that the ones of Christ was going to see him and not the entire world. But let's keep going. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. See, what happened in Adam's day, Adam went up to the garden. Now we have, in the New Testament, Christ and the Father is coming to man. So instead of man having to go to them, they're coming to us. And he said, If you love him, the Father and him will come and will make their home with the person they love. Now, is this Christ saying that him and the Father is going to come and and get an apartment beside you and pay rent? Is this what he's saying? He's going to come and and find a a place that's open uh, around your house that you didn't bought, and he's going to stay beside you. And that's how he's going to live with you. Okay. Let's go to 1 John 3. We're going to find out how Christ and the Father is coming and making their home with mankind. 1 John 3, 22 through 24. And whatever we ask we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. <clears throat> so let's see if it's the commandments that Moses had to keep. Let's find out. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Why is that so important? Verse 24, now he who keeps his commandments abide in him and he in him abide and let's let's look up that word abide first john 3 24 let's see if we can find it first john 3 24 let's see what the word abide let's see if we can find it real quick or right, it says dwelleth here out of the kjv but it means uh in a given place a state of relation expectancy, abide, continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, stand, tarry, abide on. So these these people are within each other's presence. But notice here it says, I would dwell in him. Now that's the KJV. The new KJ the new King James says uh, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. So this is the inside. This is them being on your inside. And by this, we know that he abides in us. This is how we know he lives in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So through the Spirit who teaches all things, bring all things to the remembrance, right? The Spirit who gives us the visions, who gives us the dreams, right? Through the Spirit, through that Spirit, that's how we know that the Father in Christ has made their home inside of us. So how are you 
looking for the Father in Christ to be inside of a building or a castle when they are inside of you. You are the building. You are the castle. So, let's keep going. Let's keep going. And this is something that you have to realize through heavenly understanding. The Holy Spirit gives you wisdom. Wisdom dealing with heavenly understanding. So, when you get to Revelation 21, 1 through 4, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down, right? Coming, coming down, coming to man, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Remember, he said, I'm going to give you a new mind. I'm going to give you a new spirit. And now you have that new mind. You have that new spirit. You look at things new. You have a new understanding. Now you understand that Christ and the Father is in you. You understand that you are the temple of the living God. You don't think so? You don't think uh, Christ is going to be in you, amongst you, around you? You think that you should be seeing Christ uh, uh in a physical form, him and the Father standing beside you, like like we should, like our uh, body will be able to uh, handle all that glory. But but you you think that's what we should be doing? Well, let's let's go to uh Second Corinthians sixteen. Let's see. I mean, sorry, Second Corinthians six, verse sixteen. It states. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The Father dwells inside of you. Kingdom means rulership. If the rulership of God, the rulership of God is supposed to be in you. The only way you can see the rulership of God is if you have a heavenly mind. If you have a heavenly mind, the Garden of Eden is inside of your mind. The Father dwells inside of the Garden of Eden. The Holy of Holies is the Garden of Eden. The Holy of Holies was inside of the temple. You are the temple. You see how all of this makes sense? This is all about the person. It's all about the person. It's never been about what they're teaching you today, about a building coming out of a sky. Uh, uh, Christ coming with two billion angels to kill people. That's That never was the message. You got to have a heavenly mind to understand the message. So once you go to Luke, and y'all, we finna wrap it up. I'm, I'm going to go to Luke, and then we're just going to go to uh, the fruit of the spirits, and then we'll be done. That will be, that will be it. So once we go to Luke 17, Talking about the same kingdom of heaven, right? And verse 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor would they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And you have a little note right here that says, it means in your midst. It means it's among you perfect 
because Christ is supposed to be among us. And if we're in the Garden of Eden, Christ is among us. Then he said to the disciples, oh, no, that's, that's why I want to stop it right there. So the kingdom of God, no one, Christ clearly stated, let me state. Remember he said, my kingdom is not from the, of this world. If it was, my servants would come fight for me, but my kingdom is not from hence. Uh, hopefully I paraphrased that right. I'm just trying to go off memory. But clearly here, people go here and you show them this and the kingdom of heaven automatically gets snatched from their minds. They go back to Revelation and try to make it be a carnal place. Christ clearly stated, uh, I think they, they let the brother up. I'm sorry if they did or didn't. Uh, but Christ clearly stated that the kingdom does not come with observation. And I don't mind y'all letting uh, whoever up. They just got to wait till I'm done. Uh, it said the kingdom does not come with observation. If you look up the word observation, it means, in fact, let's just look it up for the crowd. The kingdom does not come with observation. The word observation right there. I'm going to give you the, the definition. Observation. Let me see here. G3907. Inspection. That is ocular evidence so now ocular evidence so when i look up the word ocular ocular means of or connected with the eyes or vision so it's clearly stating the kingdom is not something you're going to see with your eyes. Nor will they say, see here or see there. You're not going to be able to see it. For indeed, the kingdom, the rulership of God, the Garden of Eden, is within or in your midst. That's what they taught. Everyone knew it wasn't a building. Even when reading John's vision, the people who had the spirit, we're not talking about the church fathers who came in and icky, icky remixed it. We're talking about the actual Jews. They knew it was not. And when I say Jews, I mean the Holy Spirit people, the one who had the Holy Spirit. They knew it wasn't a building coming out the sky. They knew that. So, let's get ready to end it, right? So, uh, so now, when I go to Galatians, five, I'm going to read 18 through 21, because I had a whole lot more stuff about the law and sin and etc. But I want to uh, actually say this. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What Paul got this from, Paul is back in the Garden of Eden. He's in the Kingdom of Heaven. He's seeing how the Spirit, the voice, the Spirit was walking through the Garden. The Spirit was walking through the Garden. And when the spirit was walking through the garden, there was no law that spirit was under. Once again, that spirit, that voice, that heavenly man, he wasn't under any law in the garden. So if you are being led by that spirit, you won't be under a law either. Because, this, look, let's keep going, 19. Now, this is the works. The works of the flesh are evident. This is the earthly man who needs a law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, 
contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, all the things you see on Clubhouse by the people teaching. All of these qualities are by our quote-unquote teachers of Clubhouse. Envy, let's keep going though. Envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's no inheritance for you. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have been crucified, sorry, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is what happened to the first Adam when he got the Holy Spirit and went into the heavenly realm, he crucified his flesh and his passions and desires. He went into this heavenly state. But then he transgressed and had to be put under commandments. And if we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So we clearly have it right there. And as I showed you earlier, the kingdom of Christ, the rulership of Christ, the rulership of the Father is love, joy, peace, and the Holy Spirit. The only way the Father abides in you, that you being the Holy of Holies, you, your mind being the Holy of Holies, your mind being the Garden of Eden narrative, the only way Christ abides in you, the Father abides in you, is if you have the fruits of the Spirit. The Bible itself was always about shaping the mind of man, getting them back into the heavenly mindset, them creating more heavenly mindset people so we could produce and create a heavenly reality on this plane. It never was about the carnality. To be carnally minded is death. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's what it brought. What it, rep what it brought. To be spiritually minded is life. That would be Christ and the tree of life. Thank you all for listening in. This is Elvin Israel, RPK, Resurrection uh, Prophecy and Kingdom. It says wisdom, uh, all things fulfilled, and A-O-S-D-C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. And I am one of the admins of the Garden of Eden. Thank you everyone for listening. This is Elvin Israel. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Stay in Shalom. Thank you for clicking on the channel. AOSD. Assembly of Sound Doctrine Channel. Assembly of Sound Doctrine. AOSD. RPK. Resurrection from the Kingdom. Like, subscribe, share. Let's go. Oh. Come get a lesson. I'm teaching blessings. No need for guessing. I'm knowledge testing. It's truth time. The wise will shine. And the wicked will pine. I'm a righteous kind. Break out of trouble, I'm
deep in the settle, just me and my brothers and sisters. They left us, they fixing the puzzle, the stress, and I come to the bunker. The struggle will answer the cuz. Wanna read it, believe it, they should be back. See that and need it like a kid back. Breaches and pieces like a kid cat. I can use it, I get seasoned. It's Hollywood, not Dollywood. Apple love, the kingdom within. AOSD is for missing. On PK, let you get to begin. It's a poly world, not Dolly world. I beloved, the kingdom within. AOSD is for missing. On PK, let you join to begin. AOSD, 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 AOSD,